Good morning and, uh, and welcome uh, to the NCCN Patient Advocacy Summit, Value in Cancer Care, the Patient Perspective. Uh, I'm Bob Carlson, the CEO at NCCN, and it's hard to believe it's December 1st, uh, but it is. And so uh, here we are. We have a very, I think, uh, exciting agenda. Um, there will be, uh, I'm confident, a lot of uh, perspectives, uh, information, and ideas uh, that come out of today's uh, session. Uh, as some background, uh, today's session is being recorded uh, in its entirety, uh, and in part because of that, but also for the rest of the audience uh, here that's present, uh, during the question and answer period, there will be a microphone, a circulating microphone, and we ask that you use that uh, while you make your questions uh, or comments. Uh, we also uh, thank uh, the multiple uh, sponsors, uh, supporters uh, of uh, today's uh, activity. Uh, without these multiple uh, sponsors and supporters, uh, today's session uh, could simply uh, not occur. Uh, through the generous support of these uh, individuals, we've also been able to uh, bring uh, to D.C. Uh, multiple, multiple representatives of uh, patient advocacy organizations as well, who likely otherwise would not have been able to attend uh, today's session. Uh, this is the agenda uh, for the day. Um, we will be alternating uh, keynote speakers uh, and panels. So the keynote speakers will sort of frame some of the issues, uh, and then the individual panels uh, will take off and discuss uh, those issues uh, more, more completely. Uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce a fellow Stanford Cardinal uh, as our first uh, speaker, uh, Lois Pace. Uh, Lois is the Executive Advisor for Programs and Policy uh, at the Livestrong Foundation. Uh, she leads the Foundation's agenda pr to promote legislation, regulations, and standards uh, in favor of people worldwide affected by or at risk for cancer. Uh, before joining uh, the Livestrong Foundation, uh, Lois served as Director of Regional Programs for the American Cancer Society's Department of Global Health uh, and was responsible for developing their first capacity building and advocacy programs in Southeast Asia uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree with honors uh, from Stanford University uh, and a master's degree uh, from, uh, in public health uh, from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Lois. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I actually heard someone talking about the Notre Dame game, so I won't mention it because I know there are mixed feelings about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I will start uh, with the story that our former CEO used to tell. Um, you know, uh, in advance of the passage of the Affordable Care Act, I think a lot of us in this room were really pushing for um, important patient protections and. Um, you know, Liv Strong was among the groups uh, celebrating the passage of the act because we really believed um, in what it stood for and a lot of what we thought it would provide for our constituents. Um, but it wasn't without controversy among our own uh, network of, of supporters. And uh, lo and behold, uh, after our CEO had published a blog or something about uh, the importance of the act and how happy we were, he received a box of cut up yellow wristbands in the mail. Um, saying how this one particular person was not going to support us anymore because of, of where we stood. And I think um, while that was an extreme reaction, I think, uh, we, we still can, wanted to ask ourselves whether it was all worth it. And we certainly did think so, but I think that's sort of what, um, what I wanted to kind of talk about here today. So Going back to 2010, what were we all excited about? There were a number of provisions that really, again, we thought made sense to people affected by cancer. And this certainly isn't a complete list. But you had, for example, um, the you no longer had an issue where as someone who had heard the words, you have cancer, be denied insurance either before or after um, signing up for that coverage. That we thought was a good thing. We also were able to do away with caps, um, spending caps either by year or over a lifetime. And then we had greater access to treatment options like clinical trials. In addition, there are a number of provisions that not just were relevant to people living with cancer, but also the general public, like preventive screenings, being on one's plan until the age of 26, and so on. So again, all good things um, from our perspective. 
But coming into 2014, um, what we wanted to be sure we did among our constituents first and foremost was really take a snapshot of what they thought. A few years after the passage, once all the politics and Supreme Court rulings, et cetera, had played out, and really make sure that our, our team, our team yellow, if you will, still was very much behind this act. Um, and so we, we did a quick sort of opinion poll of folks after the end of open enrollment, um, actually in April of 2014. And we found that in general, people still viewed the act positively. Um, and, uh, and one of the reasons we wanted to do this again was because of this reaction that we had gotten back in 2009 and 2010. Um, but when it came to people's um, sense of the law for themselves, that opinion was more mixed. And so you'll see I put up some quotes from our survey. Um, there's, again, this relief that people are really pleased that they no longer have to worry about uh, being denied coverage uh, or even having to stay at a job that they don't like because of insurance. So these. This is showing people's you know, positive reaction, um, and again, as, as the law relates to themselves personally. But you had a bit of apprehension. You had some folks saying, you know, I don't know what the future holds. I'm getting these letters in the mail, and I'm told I have to switch, and I think it's going to be good, but I'm not sure. And so I think this last quote around um, being covered but having increased rates really represents um, what the feedback that we received well. There's sort of this sense folks being on the fence in this sense that, yes, it could be a good thing for me, but it might not come without some sort of challenge or, or cost. And so beyond that, um, we said, okay, we have a sense of what people think about the law. What's really happening? How are people actually able to use um, their coverage, including coverage that wasn't purchased out, um, in, within the marketplaces, but how are people sort of operating in the new normal of the Affordable Care Act was a question that we wanted to answer. And just stepping back a bit, I mean, I think we saw it as our responsibility as an advocacy organization to serve a few roles when it came to um, tracking the trends around the Affordable Care Act. One was to serve sort of a watchdog function, right, to be sure that um, people weren't sort of behaving badly in this space and that provisions were being honored um, as they had been set out. There's also uh, this interest um, among advocacy groups to really be sure we're flagging these sort of unforeseen issues like open enrollment and the debacle that that tended to be in terms of logistics and administration. And then finally, there was an interest in really looking at, um, looking for outstanding needs that weren't being met, like data issues, like cost, et cetera. And so we were able to partner with American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network um, to commission a study by the Urban Institute building on their health reform monitoring survey. And people are probably familiar with this tool. They've been fielding this tool since early 2013 on a quarterly basis. And the Urban Institute, um, even though it's a small sample and is, is a bit prone to response bias because of it being an online survey, it really benchmarks well against other similar federal surveys. So we felt pretty confident in the tool itself. And what Urban was able to do was oversample um, a group of cancer survivors so that we could draw comparisons between cancer survivors and the general public, again, in terms of how things were going for them when it came to health care um, following the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act. And so some core questions that Urban was asking as part of this process um, were around coverage, whether or not people had coverage to begin with whether or not there are any issues with people accessing or otherwise utilizing that coverage, and then finally the affordability, affordability of that coverage. So I'm just going to go through a few of the top line findings of the urban report um, so that people get a sense of, of what they found in this, again, early stage. So what you'll see here is essentially the, the status of coverage um, among cancer survivors as compared to um, other groups. And let's see if this works. Yes. Um, this is a really good thing we like to see, right? A vast majority of cancer survivors actually have coverage. That's good. That's what we want. We don't want to see low numbers. We'd like that to be 100%, of course, but I think 96% is pretty good. We also see here there's this 9% that actually had acquired some level of coverage within the past 12 months. Now, we don't know if they were able to do so under open enrollment, but it aligns well with sort of when that happened. And so the assumption could be that more people came online as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Again, a good thing. And then finally, this last number is, is, is what we like to see in terms of 
the people without insurance. Of course, we want that to be zero, but 3.5 is a pretty good percentage in terms of people who are still left without, without insurance. There's still work to do, but we don't have far to go. Now we get into the issue of access. And um, what we're seeing here is still good news for the most part. And so we have people, survivors in particular, who are actually able to get their routine checkups and more specifically able to see a specialist um, in the year since they've had this coverage. Um, not surprising to see that those numbers are that much greater than the general public, again, because these are people who are either living with or have been affected by cancer. They have to um, arguably um, access the healthcare system more. But the good news is that they are they have a good level of connectedness to the system, which was what this question was really trying to get at. This number, however, is still disconcerting. You have one in five cancer survivors who are saying that they have um, an un a problem accessing care. And that was measured in a number of ways. It could have been people didn't feel like they were able to get schedule appointments in a timely manner. Um, they um, maybe heard from providers that they weren't accepting new patients or their type of insurance. Um, so there are a number of reasons for this. But again, this one out of five survivors is something we wanna, we wanna be mindful of in terms of access issues. But finally, um, even despite that, there is still this high level of satisfaction among survivors when it comes to the access they've been able to, to achieve under these new plans or under their existing plans. Now, affordability is where you, know, you get a little bit into the, the bad news, unfortunately. So here, um, you'll see that it's high for both cancer survivors and um, adults without cancer. There is still largely, um, in general, just people who are reporting that they are experiencing unmet care needs as a result of the cost of care. This is a problem. It's not surprising for this group, again, but it's still a problem, and, and I think this and other data confirm that. Specifically for cancer survivors, you have this 22% that report problems paying for medical bills in the past 12 months, and in addition to that, this big number here, this 39.5%, um, the fact that there are nearly twice as many cancer survivors who are paying over $2,000 out of pocket, that's something that we want to be mindful of. And it reflects a lot of the stories that we hear, obviously, around the cost of care and how that's an issue. One thing I want to say about this, too, is that it's an issue for folks um, who are arguably most vulnerable. So you have people of lower socioeconomic status, you have um, folks with multiple chronic conditions, and so when people, those people aren't getting their needs met, it has sort of a ripple effect or a compound effect. The study did also find that there is a particular problem, however, among sort of the lower middle class that were, didn't have the level of resources they needed to sort of offset the problem, and then also weren't being caught in these sort of safety net programs like Medicaid. So that's something else that I know um, uh, there's going to be a later panel on costs, but I just wanted to, to flag this because you can't really decouple um, costs from access, unfortunately, and I think this is what this data shows. And so just a little bit more on cost just because it's, uh, or, or affordability, just because it, it really still stands out as a problem um, based on this survey. Livestrong uh, did an analysis or conducted a survey among our survivors back in, in 2012. And our surveys generally capture a, a lot of people, um, so we're fortunate to have this particular survey represent about 5,000 respondents back in 2012. And again, you have a third of survivors really saying that they had to borrow money or go into debt, that they had to make other financial sacrifices like dipping into savings, retirement or college or otherwise, putting up their homes. Um, and so it's really a, very much a financial burden. We also have since repeated this survey, and that data is wrong. Actually, we repeated it this year, not in 2014. And so that's why the data is still, are still pending. And we asked some of the same questions about out-of-pocket costs, financial sacrifices, and we added some questions around whether or not providers have been communicating with patients about some of the financial risks. And what we're seeing um, preliminarily are some of the same trends. And so I put this up to really say, okay, pre-ACA is one thing, and I think the MEPS data was just published as well in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, really showing that there are issues among survivors, you know, pre-2012 um, when it comes to finances. But we, even when we look at post-2014, those, um, those issues still persist. So what are we seeing kind of beyond 
the data. Um, I, you know, I, I think the numbers certainly do matter, but the stories do as well. And um, I think we're all aware of the access anecdotes that have been in the news. One thing I tried to do here was just put up a number of headlines that um, I came across over the past year and a half or so really highlighting this issue. So the fact that folks are insured but not covered, um, the fact that insurers are offering more and more narrow networks, um, questioning whether or not patients themselves really do have a choice, um, and so on. Now, the, I think the, the tendency might be for, maybe not for us in this room, but for others to kind of dismiss these as very unique problems. But um, the reality is probably that it's, it's not as much of an anomaly. It just happens to be for more of a niche group. It doesn't mean it's something that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't address. And we have some data that bears this out. So I just wanted to put up this, um, this chart um, from the, uh, the LDI at UPenn that was funded by RWJ. So they came out with their report back in June, really um, kind of as a mirror to the McKinsey report that looked at the prevalence of narrow networks. I know the McKinsey report looked at hospitals, LDI looked more at providers, but they both had similar findings. And that was mainly that there are about 40% prevalence of these never, narrow networks, which is really not a great sign. And then when this LDI report looked further at oncology, they found that that was more around 60%. Um, and when they were able to do a state, a state breakdown a little bit later, you can see this sort of geographic variability. So again, to the point of it not necessarily being a uniform problem, you still have issues in these red and even orange states um, regarding the prevalence of narrow networks. And so I'm looking forward to hear what the panel has to say about this. I know that we have Cancer Center is um, uh, representing various parts of the country. I know Avalier will be here as well and can probably speak a lot better to this, um, including the report that they did with NCCN on how this is affecting cancer centers. And so again, I think they found that maybe this wasn't as much of a problem as was being reported in 2014, but you still have um, a quarter of centers reporting that they might be excluded. And it could be that it's because they're falling into these geographic areas where you have this high prevalence of narrow networks. So just to say there's, there's more to unpack here. And uh, I'm looking forward to sort of what we can all do to try to unpack this problem. I think that it would be great to have more and more surveys, obviously, of the patient and survivor community to really get a better sense of what it is they're experiencing from them. Of course, we want to sort of hear from patients, obviously, to inform whatever it is we do. And I welcome others who um, want to partner in collecting that kind of information, because it, the, with the more data, um, the more we'll be able to answer that question. But beyond that, I think we can think in, ter in three ways, I guess. One is in terms of coverage. So obviously, coverage is still very much, some very much something we want, but we want that, obviously, to be a, of high value. So looking at a good quality and at a modest or reasonable cost. We also want to be thinking more consumer facing and so making sure that um, we were providing information to patients for them to make good decisions. And frankly, it's not enough to just have a list of contact information of providers. People really do need to understand how various providers fit into their networks and what it means for them to choose one plan or another with regards to how they're really going to be expecting to utilize their care or their coverage, excuse me. And then finally, I think compliance is obviously going to be, be a big issue, making sure that industry um, or that we're holding industry accountable and uh, making sure that there isn't this preponderance of, of narrow networks in a way that limits access to care. I think the National Insurers Commission um, is a step in the right direction. I think that there's some more ways that, that the government or other um, watchdogs can step in and be sure that that compliance is something that we track as well. Um, but again, from an advocacy perspective, and I think this is where I want to end, I think we at Livestrong ask ourselves the question, what more we can do? Um, and this has been an issue throughout the debate around the ACA. You know, we're not econ bus, we're not insurance folks. What can we do to be sure that we're ser best serving um, patients and survivors? And I think that we want to continue to tell the story, if nothing else. We want to continue to elevate the issues. Um, and highlight the challenges that people might be having or even the success stories that we're uncovering. But we need to be telling their stories because only then can that spur more research and more action in this space. Beyond storytelling, I know there are a number of groups in this room also who are very well equipped to provide services and solutions to patients. And so coupling the storytelling with the service and support I think is really going to be essential moving forward until we come up with a really good solution in terms of access to care. Thanks.
So I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Um, I just bought from GPO the ACA. Mm -hmm. Since it's not one of my accounts, I didn't concentrate on ACA or DHHS. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, do you have like the USCs, the titles and the sections so I can possibly jump to that because it is a little big and I am suffering from chemo brain? No, I wouldn't. I don't have that information. I apologize. But perhaps I can try to get that for you following. Okay, I took your email. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Bob Adams. Can you tell me uh, whether there's a trend in general in, uh, in cancer medicine and uh, in prostate cancer in mm -hmm. particular, uh, which is uh, something I have, unfortunately. Uh, there's a tendency to, uh, to feel that patients have been over-treated in the past, and perhaps uh, they're now paying more attention to the quality of life instead of simply curing the cancer. Sure, yeah, I think there's certainly a trend in particular with prostate cancer around overtreatment, and, and I think we'll get more into discussion when we talk about value in terms of what better outcomes we'd like to see and not just sort of pushing people into screening or treatment, but rather um, really doing something that can help um, achieve those, those greater outcomes. And it is going to be relevant in, in terms of costs, too. Um, of course, I know a number of patient groups are concerned about things like rationing, and so we want to be sure that information that we're providing, obviously, is, is, um, is evidence-based and iterative in a way that keeps up with the science, et cetera. But certainly, I think that's, that's where things are headed. You mentioned um, people having to um, take money from college funds and things like that to pay for care. But doesn't it make more sense to have the loans and the cost bore by someone who has a full working life ahead of them as opposed to someone who is at the tail end? Yes, yeah, so you mean does it make more sense for folks going into debt to be able to, right? Yeah, no, and I, and I think, um, and I apologize if I sort of, I don't know, offered some sort of opinion of borrowing from college funds. If that's what people have to do, that's what people have to do. I think, I think where we're concerned is that we, we don't want people to have to make so many financial sacrifices that it doesn't set them up for success later in life. Your, your cancer diagnosis shouldn't send you into bankruptcy, and it shouldn't affect whether or not your child can actually get a higher education. I think that's where we fall. And so, um, so yes, there's certainly some decisions that are, I guess, arguably more reasonable or, or better than others. It's hard to, to make a judgment point in that regard. But, but yeah, no, I think, I think some people are making the best decisions that they know how. Hi, Matthew Gary. I can, I'd like to uh, say thank you for giving this presentation. It's much appreciated. Yes. Um, I did notice that your exclusion criteria for your survey was uh, skin cancers of the um, cancers of the skin. Mm -hmm. Would that be safe to say that just included squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma, yes. and did not include melanoma? Yes. Thank you. I think that's it. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, at this point in time, I will be introducing uh, Dr. Cliff uh, Goodman and handing the rest of the moderation of uh, today's sessions uh, to him. Uh, Dr. Goodman uh, joined the Lewin Group uh, in 1996 and he has over 30 years experience working with government industry, nonprofit organizations uh, in such areas as healthcare technology assessment, comparative effectiveness research, health economics, and studies pertaining to health uh, care uh, innovation, regulation, and payment for pharmaceuticals, biologics, medical devices, uh, and other interventions. Um, he received his Doctor of Philosophy from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, a Master's of Science degree from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell University. Cliff. Thank you. And if I could have our panelists come up, our very first panelists. 
This is panel one, and this will be from audience left to right, uh, Terry Langbaum, Bonnie Miller, Lois Pace, a return visit by Lois, thank you. Caroline Pearson and David Rubin, from audience left to right, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. That's great. All right, welcome all. Terry, you're far left. And then Bonnie, yes. Great to have you here. Well, thanks, everyone. And Bob, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. It's uh, great to be uh, back at the National Press Club on the issue and the issues of the day. Uh, Lois set us up very well with some concerns about, um, and some data and some concerns about issues involving uh, uh, patient perspectives on access and other matters. Our first panel, this is the first of three panels, and this panel discussion is on access to cancer care. We're going to pick up on what Lois uh, let off with uh, just a few moments ago. Our second panel, after a break, is going to be defining value in cancer care, particularly for, from the patient perspective. We're here, going to hear a lot about value frameworks and different perspectives, what comprises value in today's world. And our third panel is going to be on the cost of cancer care and the patient impact. And so these are three uh, interrelated issues. There's just a lot going on in the news right now uh, with regard to certainly what's still going on with the Affordable Care Act and how that is playing out, certainly with the matters of affordability, um, matters of kind of where some of the smoke is clearing about some of the issues on, on patient access. The affordability issue is huge. And it's huge in part because of some of the uh, prices of some, uh, some uh, new pharmaceuticals and biologics, not just in the cancer oncology sphere, but uh, throughout healthcare as well. And so these issues, as I think, I hope you'll see, are sort of interwoven. And we're going to try to get at the, our panelists here to try to sort of make some, some better sense of this. Uh, you all have everyone's bio here, so I'm not going to, we don't have time really to go through everyone's biography. But in a second, I'm going to ask people on the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, this particular panel is going to go to about 11 o'clock, 11 a.m., and around 10, 15, 10, 20 -ish or so, I'll ask for people that may have questions, and we can do it a couple ways. Uh, at your uh, table, you've got these um, handy-dandy note cards, and you can uh, write down some question, your question there, and we'll have folks on the floor to pick them up, and they'll kind of bring them up to me, and I'll try to uh, get through to as many as I can with this panel on, on point. Also, as you've already seen, we have a floor mic, and so if you'd prefer to ask your question that way, that would be fine. So um, let's start on this matter of access to cancer care, and I'll ask start with, with Terry Langbaum at Audience Far Left. If each panelist could just say their name, their affiliation, and just what it is about their job or their personal experience that brings them to be an obvious expert on access to care and cancer. Terry. Uh, my name is Terry Langbaum. I hope you can all hear me because I'm a bit vocally challenged today. Um, I am, I've been invited to sit on this panel because I've been diagnosed with cancer three times in my life, the first time 33 years ago. So I'm a long-term cancer survivor. I've also um, just had my 40th anniversary working at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And so I've had a lot of experience in dealing with patients and their access to care over the years. Um, but the reason that I'm here today is because of my personal experience with cancer. Great. Thanks very much, Terry. Great to have you. Bonnie. Um, my name is Bonnie Miller, and I'm the Administrative Director of the Women's Cancer Center at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Um, I also oversee the Nurse Navigation Program. I have 16 nurse navigators, and we'll I guess we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm also an eight-year cancer survivor. So I think, you know, along with my clinical background and certainly being a cancer survivor myself and looking at opportunities and gaps and barriers to care, um, even in my own institution, um, certainly an opportunity. Um, and hopefully I can shed some light on some patient access initiatives we've been doing at Fox Chase. Great. Thanks, Bonnie. And you just reminded me, I hope you'll make a sort of a, a bookmark on the issue of um, how gender, how sex may affect access. Is there still sexism, patronizing of patients one way or another uh, with regard to males versus females? Is that still an issue? So if you could just make a little mental note to bring that up later on, that would be great. Okay. Uh, Lois, we've already met you and know um, what some of your issues are. And I'm going to come back to you 
in particular to kind of dig into some of the data that you shared with us before mm -hmm. from the uh, Urban Institute study yep. and the LiveStrong uh, survey as well. Uh, Caroline. Hi, I'm Caroline Pearson. I'm a Senior Vice President of Policy and Strategy at Avalier Health. Um, at Avalier, we've been digging into a lot of the impact of the Affordable Care Act and the data around uh, what benefit design and network uh, adequacy looks like in exchange plans. So we um, have done a lot of research on networks, including the survey with NCCN, um, as well as benefit design and cost sharing. Excellent. Thanks very much, Caroline. And David. Hi, I'm David Rubin. I work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I'm the manager of health outcomes and quantitative analytics. And I work in the finance department, so I kind of bridge the gap between value, cost, and access. Um, and I'm here today to discuss a uh, paper that we recently published. Um, we'll let you talk about the paper, but we'll press you on some other issues as well. Sure. You can expect that. Speaking of the issues, um, and I've kind of mod modified this a bit having listened to Lois, um, the, I think the half a dozen main issues that we're going to try to address are in approximately this order, uh, network adequacy, navigation, formularies, cost sharing and affordability, and informed decision making. So I know we could spend a whole academic semester on that or half a career on these, I know that, but let's, let's, let's try with those. And um, Caroline, if I could start with you uh, with regard to network adequacy. You've just looked at this in conjunction with NCCN. What, are sort of, what was the purpose of this study and what were your top line findings? Sure, so I think it's helpful to think about net network adequacy as two core components. Um, we have facility participation in networks and we have provider participation, physician participation in networks. Um, and those two things are not always perfectly aligned. So um, we've done two separate studies. When we partnered with NCCN because very early when the exchanges launched, uh, we had very little data on network adequacy. But we were hearing from some of the top cancer centers that they were being excluded from networks despite efforts to contract with those plans. Uh, and that was troubling. And so we surveyed NCCN members to get a sense of really what was happening uh, in those exchange plans. And I think what we found was mixed. On the one hand, uh, we had heard very dire stories that maybe all you know, top cancer centers were excluded, and that wasn't the case. Um, but we did have uh, five of the 20 centers that we surveyed who were excluded from the vast majority or all uh, exchanges in their state or in their region. So if you're a patient and want to seek cancer care at the leading center in your area, there would not be a single product sold on the exchange that would cover uh, care at that center. And that's certainly um, troubling when you start to think about access for specialty services. Um, interestingly, we looked at what the causes of that was. I mean, as I said, in some cases, these centers said we really want to participate, and they simply were being excluded, largely uh, on the basis of rates, uh, negotiated rates with the health plans. Um, although we did have some centers say, because of the rates we're being asked to sign on to, we're simply going to not participate in these products. So we saw it going both ways, mm -hmm. um, sort of intentional or uh, desired and undesired exclusion from the networks. Um, so that was interesting. And then following that, we said, OK, we really want to get a sense of what the oncologists look like in this space. So um, we dove into some new data sets that we had to look at oncologist coverage. And what we found is, compared to sort of your typical employer plan, uh, exchanges nationwide cover about 58% as many oncology providers as typical employer-sponsored insurance. So you know, what you're hearing about the notion that these plans are much, much narrower networks is really true. And it's really borne out both on that provider and on the facility side. So Carolyn, first, um, it was just interesting off the bat when you said there were a little few data on this. And yeah. the fact is, you know, how are we going to learn about uh, how the Affordable Care Act is affecting access if we don't have data? So at least maybe help establish a baseline, if nothing else, sure. and we can kind of look at trend data. So this is something we need to track over time, certainly. And with regard to um, uh, the, uh, the lack, the, the less than comprehensive uh, availability, is that a geographic access problem? In other words, are people too distant from care? to have sufficient access? Is that, does that problem roll off of this? It, uh, so you know, certainly the notion of cancer deserts and, and rural right. access has, has persistently been a problem Still. Uh, you know, across all insurance markets. Um, I, I think it's not geographic specific here. I mean, really, mm -hmm. what you need to understand about this market is uh, the Affordable Care Act creates a lot of new requirements for health plans, really important requirements around benefit design and patient protections. Um, but it also creates an individual market where people are 
paying out of pocket for their premium, not, you know, not whichever plan their employer selected for everybody, but one-on-one, -on -one, what is the best plan for me? And they're really gravitating towards lower cost products, right? They're buying based on sticker price, that premium. And is there any sense from your data or other sources that buying based on sticker price is having any uh, effect on, on access to state-of-the-art care and or outcomes? Certainly, uh, network design has been critical to bringing those premiums down. So plans that have narrower networks tend to have lower premiums. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if people are gravitating towards lower networks, uh, they tend to have a narrower, sorry, gravitating towards lower premiums, they right. tend to have a narrower network. Um, what we don't know is, you know, for a specific cancer patient, mm -hmm. are they able to make an informed choice mm -hmm. and say, well, I, I can't have a narrow network product, so I'm going to buy a more expensive plan, or uh, is that information even available to them? And as we said, it's really uh -huh. hard as a consumer to even figure out how broad your network is, uh, even once you have an oncologist and have a facility where you're being treated, let alone before you have a cancer diagnosis and may have selected uh, a, a narrow network plan thinking, you know, I'm a healthy person, and suddenly you realize the care I need isn't included in my plan. So that also sounds like an information gap. Absolutely. How can patients make these informed decisions? So, Lois, you've been largely nodding your head yes, in agreement. agreement. Is this, is what you're hearing from, from Caroline and Avalier, does that align with your observations, and can, can you kind of enrich that at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it aligns with what we're hearing, and then what we what the data bore. You know, I mean, the mm -hmm. fact that um, look, I I can't talk without talking about personal stories, and so something um, we heard a couple of weeks back. Um, we're in Texas, so obviously there are a lot of issues uh, with the rollout of the ACA in Texas and, and access to care and insurance in Texas. And we were hearing from one of our constituents how she suddenly received this letter um, to coincide with open enrollment that said that she would be excluded from MD Anderson. And she's had two cancer diagnoses, both that have been treated at MD Anderson. And so it's not that she can't go to MD Anderson, but that would be out of network, right? And that would be out of pocket. And she, like, like Caroline was saying, didn't fully understand that, that by signing up for this plan, that that meant that she would be excluded. And further, I think that didn't apply last year. I think she did, actually did do a lot of that research and did the hard work of really figuring out the best option for her and her family. And she did come out of pocket more than she really wanted to um, in the end because they said that she would be okay. And then suddenly now, for 2016, she won't be okay. And so I think that's another frustrating thing for, mm. for patients and survivors. They, we're, we're telling them that the answer right now is for them to do the best they can with work with the information they have, which is so scarce. And so they do all that hard work and, and go through our navigation services and, and utilize other resources. And still, they're stuck um, with this problem. So, Bonnie, um, and we haven't discussed this before just now, from your standpoint uh, at Fox Chase, your well-recognized cancer institution, the implication in this discussion, or I should say the concern in this discussion, is that narrower network access may ultimately affect patient autonomy and patient outcomes. Do you, are you aware of any evidence to that effect yet? And that's the concern. If I'm a patient or family member and I've been told, well, you've been working with this cancer doctor and now you can't anymore, or now you're in this plan and I've just gotten a cancer diagnosis, but you can only see these, these oncologists, I might be concerned that somehow my access to the best care for me might mm -hmm. be limited. Any sense of evidence or data pointing to that yet? Uh, not necessarily evidence or data, but I can I can speak just from what we see in the media. There's a it's heavily um, heavily saturated with a lot of marketing. Come to our center, you know, and you know you'll see a nice patient story and a really good outcome. And um, you know we talk about sort of the quality of care, so being able to deliver the care and do it in a quality um, context. I think what, what's very hard for patients, and at least, and, and I'll speak for my nurse navigators, and, and our program at Fox Chase is I have all RNs as navigators, and their concern is, you know, I want to focus on the clinical um, barriers and, and be able to help patients, you know, get into the system and get to the right point of care, and how in the world am I going to understand all of these insurance, insurance barriers, and how am I going to understand what the patients needed, and so we've created this level, and I know the advisory board has done a lot of research on financial navigators and actually having that built into your system. And so we have financial counselors. We don't, we don't call them navigators. We just call them financial counselors at Fox Chase, where patients, even with a Medicare plan, will go through financial counseling. And so there, there's much more transparency um, in, in the cost. Like here, here's your mm -hmm. co-pays 
for your diagnostic workup, your radiology, here's the copay for infusion services, radiation services, and I think that's been a lot more successful. What's really hard is when, when patients change their plans, and you know employers are changing plans left and right because of cost containment and being able to stay up on that, and then having patients you know, make, face a decision about what to do. Yeah. So you know, I'm spe speaking very um, experientially, um, mm -hmm. but that's sort of the scary part, I think, for patients. And I think for The scary people, part is what? For patients, is to understand, what? you know, is really to understand what their insurance covers, not only you know, do, we, do I have a cancer diagnosis? You might be choosing a plan with your employee at low cost, right? What's the, what's the easiest out of my pocket um, for the time being, not anticipating in 2016 when I go for my mammogram, they're going to find something and I'm going to have breast cancer. And what does that mean? That means the diagnostic workup, that means chemotherapy, that might mean radiation, and all of those things. And you didn't consider that when you certainly picked your plan. Good point. So there is the, the concern that... Um, I will, this limit, some notion of limited access may affect my financial viability as well as my access to what I think is the best care. But Terry, and by the way, we'll come back to navigation in a few minutes. Right. Terry Langbaum, um, in your experience, do you consider that network adequacy or so-called network insufficiency is a true barrier to high quality care and outcomes, or is it just all about the affordability side of it? Um, I think it is a true barrier, and I think any of us that have worked with a parent that has Medicare and you've tried to figure out how to get them covered for inpatient, outpatient, and drug costs, we're talking about the ACA, but many more people over the age of 65 will get cancer than under the age of 65, and these Medicare Advantage plans have extremely narrow networks. And I think that many people over the age of 65 do not understand what they're doing when they hand over a Medicare card. They think that they're getting lower cost coverage, and they are, until they try and access a tertiary center for care, and they find that they are completely out of network. And many of these plans do not even have an out of network option. And I've been through this with my mother. So I think that we have to be cognizant not just of the ACA and what's happening with the exchange plans, but what's happening with Medicare Advantage in this country. And I'm going to guess that most patients, because of cost, will hand over their Medicare card to an insurance company, and that insurance company will do everything that they can to control the costs of that particular patient. So I think it is a big issue. It is. Mm -hmm. and but we have all heard insurance companies say, or chief medical officers and so forth say, that we're not sure we've seen any evidence that um, limited networks have an impact on quality of care and outcomes. So perhaps those data still need to be collected, but that's sort of the counter case being made. David, any comments on that, on that issue with regard to networks and referrals? Sure. Um, the, what we found is that we've been excluded from a lot of, uh, of these limited network plans. You Memorial Sloan Kettering? Yes, we Memorial Sloan Kettering. Okay. And um, we've actually gone out and spoken to all these insurance carriers trying to get our patients coverage for with their plans. And some of them have said, well, we're worried about adverse selection, where if we um, contract with you, we'll see a higher mix of cancer patients, which will adversely affect um, you know, their bottom line. Um, but we've actually gone back and done uh, studies with um, Milton and Robertson to uh, assess whether the extra payment that you get under the uh, ACA for having higher risk patients covers that cost for cancer. And we believe it covers it and then some. It so, does. So, it, so is, it is making a difference. So it's, it, well, the exclusion from the network mm -hmm. will... Um, will reduce, uh, they're worried that they're going to reduce the, their bottom line, which will, they'll actually increase their bottom line because the cancer benefit is greater than the, um, uh -huh. than the, the cost of care. So um, we're going out and trying to speak to insurance carriers to tell them, you know, the, the conventional way that you've been looking at this might not be accurate. You're saying you're worth it. Yes. Well, uh, worth it in more than one way, um, financially and as far as outcomes are concerned. Okay. 
I want to go to, to navigation now. Uh, Bonnie, you brought it up, but I want to start with Terry, actually. Terry talked about having been a patient. And just um, before you get into how navigation should be and how swell it can be, and I know Bonnie can address that, what has been a, your personal experience with regard to the ability to navigate the system? And just, you're not the average cancer patient. No. Um, but I've had several experiences with navigation that are interesting, and I don't think they're atypical. My first experience with um, a sort of form of navigation was that the day that I went for my biopsy for um, breast cancer, a volunteer navigator was assigned to me. That was not something I asked for, nor was it something I wanted. You didn't want? No. And um, I was trying to adjust to the notion that I might have breast cancer, and I did not want to be entertained by, nor did I want to entertain a person that I didn't know, even though she had had a breast cancer experience. So making the assumption that someone wants to be navigated is not a good assumption. So that's point number one. Well taken. <laughs> the second point is that um, my insurance provides navigation. We have a high intensity care management program in my insurance. I was contacted by that care management program one year after my diagnosis. What possibly could that program do? And I was offered $200 to join the high intensity care management program. The only thing that could have generated that invitation were my high bills during the previous year for breast cancer treatment. And so when that navigation phone call came, um, they left a message saying that I was invited to join this high intensity managed program. And I called them back because I was curious. And I got someone on the phone who was not medical at all. Poor person was just sort of a clerical person who was making these phone calls. I think somebody gave her a list of people who had big bills during the previous year. And uh, when she got me on the phone, um, she said, you're invited to join this high intensity care management program. I said, well, that's very interesting, but I'm no longer under care, I'm finished care, and I'm not um, getting further care at this point in time. She was completely baffled by that, so she went through a whole list of conditions. Well, do you have congestive heart failure? No. Do you have diabetes? No. Um, do you have cancer? I said, I had cancer and I've been treated. She was completely without words to understand what to say to me, but I knew what was going on. It happens way too late. If that care management is going to be helpful, it has to happen at the time of diagnosis. And it doesn't because it happens when the bills are generated and then when someone gets around to looking at the list and making contact with the patients. So, how not to be patient navigated, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So, Bonnie, is there a flip side to that coin? We just heard how it ought not be done. Have we learned from experiences such as Terry's? I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I need to start out and say I'm That's sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm very interesting, and many of you know that you know certainly navigation has been built in as a standard, um, you know, for COC accredited programs, um, breast accredited, and any PPC programs. So you have to have it in some you know way, shape, or form, but. When we thought about doing it, and I've been a nurse also for um, almost 36 years, and I've been navigating patients technically all of my career, um, whether it be in an intensive care setting with families or whether it be in long-term care. I, I worked in chemotherapy on an IV team. Like we navigate patients and we help patients, um, and sort of that's, that's really the role of a nurse. So when we decided to formalize the program in, um, in 2010 at Fox Chase, um, we, many, many staff were, you know, social work, um, nurse practitioners, nurses, well, we're, I'm already navigating patients. So um, I was, li I just listened. I just really, really listened. Um, I listened to physicians saying that they had patients 
um, that, um, that said I called Fox Chase and it took me three or four times to get through. Um, I had doctors who were testing the new patient office line and saying every time I call it's busy. Um, and so I was just sort of listening to what was happening. And so I started in the new patient office and we were beginning to be disease specific. So I started with the, with the um, schedulers that were picking up the breast calls. Um, and so that was a number that we had put out there in advertising in the community. And so um, I sort of, you know, looked and I sort of watched and listened and talked to them. Interestingly enough, um, a new breast cancer patient calling on the phone to Fox Chase, the new patient scheduler was spending about 45 to 50 minutes on the phone with that patient. About 65% of the conversation was clinical. The patient had a diagnosis, had, had a biopsy at a local hospital, you know, and so there she sits with her pathology report. She wants to come to Fox Chase, you know, continue her care, continue her work up. And we put a non-clinical person on the phone talking to her. 65% of that conversation, clinical questions. So I would hear the scheduler, well, I can't really answer that. I'll get somebody to answer that question. I can't really answer that. I'll get somebody, I, I can get somebody to call you back. What, so we created our own barrier. So we created a, you know, sort of a, um, you know, um, in the new patient office, um, they were spending a lot of time. And so we sort of revamped that. And we started with breast navigation. That's, you know, your highest tumor registry volume and most of us start with breast. And so we put a nurse navigator and connected that person with the scheduler. So the scheduler could say, let me take some information, demographic, I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect you to a breast navigator who can answer those questions for you. So putting a clinical person, and all of us, some of us are nurses in the room or some of us have been, been patients, you'll tell a nurse pretty much anything. Maybe not necessarily your doctor right away, but that nurse you're gonna tell information to. So you get a clinical nurse on the phone talking to the patient, sort of pull, pulling down those barriers beginning to explain the diagnosis, t taking a patient that was maybe in, diagnosed with invasive breast cancer versus somebody with DCIS and sort of saying, this is sort of the difference and this is, this is gonna be what things are gonna look like moving forward. Let me connect you to the provider. Let me tell you what that visit's gonna look like. I'm gonna help you get your pathology slides that you had at the local hospital, get some of your imaging. We re-review that for you. So our pathologists and radiologists take a look at that for you. And all of a sudden, you're decreasing that anxiety. The other thing that we did, because we believe too that not everybody wants to be navigated, we asked patients up front. And that was sort of a small little metric that we built in to say, you know, we have navigation, would you like to be connected to a nurse navigator? And I now have 16 across 10 disease sites and we, we pretty much range at a 98% acceptance rate for navigation. It could be, you know, a, a few touch points and then they fly, or it could be a lot of touch points in order to get the patients where they need to get. So that's helpful, Bonnie, because intentionally or not, you answered or addressed several of the concerns that Terry raised. So one is, hey, ask me first, be timely, have the right information, get the right staff for the right time, the right questions, and be, I guess, more consumer-oriented, for lack of a better term. So the things that Terry laid out as deficits, it seems though one way or another you're starting to build back up. Lois, in your kind of national view, is patient navigation of the sort that Bonnie mentioned, uh, is that the norm or is that the exception? And are we headed in a better direction? Yeah, one thing I wanted to say about both of these examples um, is that I think the counterpoint to that is, is this community-based navigation, which I think is a, oh. a good complement to what happens in, in cancer centers that are doing it well, um, like the example you just offered. And so um, in addition to wanting more information about um, um, clinical, their diagnosis or other clinical issues, um, we have found our constituents really have questions about the practical stuff. And so mm. we have a navigation services hotline. We had a center for a number of years. Um, we provide um, that sort of support online. And so again, it's something that people select versus something we, we push on them. But their major questions are around, first of all, their, their one main need is around emotional support. Um, but second, they have questions about financial issues. They really want to know how they can afford this care, um, what they can do to, to sort of pay for things, for these bills as they come along. Um, and then they have additional questions about maybe clinical trials or fertility preservation, which is something that Livestrong has really been focused on over, over the years. But it's, it's the stuff that you're not always capturing at the cancer centers. And so that's, I think, an important thing to remember that there are different models out there that are addressing what we call the practical stuff, the everyday stuff, the stuff outside of treatment and 
patient care. But it does sound like a big challenge to do the matchup right, because yeah. there, there are the clinical concerns, the emotional concerns that you just brought out, the financial concerns, and you need to have somebody who can put their hands on the right information well, at the right time. And so. therein lies the problem, right? I mean, I think that's why you have all these various models, and you have folks in the room, I see GW oh. over there, really trying to figure out what the, what the special sauce is. There, there are a number of different navigation models out there, and I still believe we have yet to figure out the, the best one. I don't know if there is one single model of navigation. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have sort of the, the sort of get them the information they need and just sort of pummel people with lots of data and resources. You also have the very high touch models that require a lot of resources, including time and money, mm -hmm. which not every organization, yeah. whether it's an NGO or a center, really has. But I do think patients require both. Um, and there are some patients who just want you to maybe send them web links and they'll sort of self-navigate versus people who really do require a 45-minute conversation. Well, that's a very helpful observation in the sense it, there are a diversity of models out there, but yeah. maybe we need a diversity of models, and at least we can learn from them. Uh, Carolyn, any observations about navigation that occurred in, in your work thus far? We haven't looked specifically at navigation. I think one of the challenges likely for the navigators is that the insurance market is changing so quickly. That's right. So, uh, you know, whereas in a tr sort of traditional sense, we had relatively limited cost sharing if you had insurance, and the networks were pretty broad, you were generally covered. And so there wasn't quite as much need for all of the insurance expertise around how do we figure out if this physician is in network, if the provider where they're working, or the hospital where they're working is in network, and right. what your costs are going to be throughout the year. Right, because two patients with the very same cancer diagnosis, the same stage and everything, can walk in with entirely different insurance coverage, yep. entirely different status for co-payments and having met a deductible, and entirely different preferences. And yep. so with that rapidly changing insurance environment, how do you provide that sort of personalized navigation? No, no, easy, no easy task. But how do you get it paid for it, too? <laughs> oh, oh, do, indeed. David, further comment on that? Um, just that um, when we're looking at, uh, we assign people not only um, the clinical side of navigation, but we also assign them a patient financial representative who they can go to to ask questions about their, their care, who's, who's in charge of trying to figure out how we're going to get paid for this and you know, what their co-pays are going to be and things like that. So they can answer those mm -hmm. questions to the patients when they have them. Who's paying for that? We do. Um, you uh, mentioned we, the financial, financial angle. You, you of all people might know that. Um, well, that's funded internally. OK. So um, and we've, one of the biggest things that I can say is that if you reduce the, the load on the patient of what they have to worry about, they're already worried about um, you know, what their treatments are, or what their uh, side effects are going to be. If you can reduce that load, um, you've done a good job. So we believe that there's an inherent benefit in spending that money to, uh, to help the patient. So I, this reminds me about so much we've heard about uh, distress in cancer care and the impact on distress, stress and anxiety, distress in particular on outcomes. And so there is even a clinical benefit to that in the shorter, longer term. Yes, and we, we've, we actually have, um, I think it's now over 100 um, clinical social work or psychologists, psychiatrists who are on staff that are meant to deal with the emotional aspects of their cancer as opposed to mm -hmm. just their financial or their treatment aspects. Yeah. Well, though they need all the above. Right? Yes, and we believe that that um, adds an added value in that um, patients get back to work quicker. Um, yeah. They're able to cope with things as they come up as opposed to uh, crashing later on. So, Carolyn, we haven't talked about this before either, but let's just throw this your way. With the movement towards um, replacing volume with value mm -hmm. and bundled payments and ACOs and oncology medical homes and so forth, to the extent that providers take on risk, financial risk, might it not be in providers' greater interests to address the sort of things David brought up and the kinds of things that Bonnie's doing and that Terry experienced, and to which Lois referred. In other words, maybe there are cost-effective ways of doing this, and maybe nurse navigation or other navigation support really might help your bottom line. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, one of the reasons that we believe, we, the, the greater healthcare community believes right. that uh, shifting risk to certain types of providers, which is an important caveat, um, may be, you know, improve outcomes and lower costs is this issue, which is they are the people who are actually interacting with the patient and can provide some of these wraparound services and can really think about that total care uh, issue 
from a both financial and quality realm. Yeah. Um, whereas I think you know, the health plans have struggled for years to say, we don't really touch these patients. It's very hard for us to address some of these sort of non-payment related uh, barriers to access and uh, barriers to quality outcomes. Yeah, so I think you know, what's emerging already from this panel is that uh, with regard to network ad adequacy and navigation, we're learning that there are smarter ways to do this. Mm -hmm. It can help multiple dimensions of the patient experience, mm -hmm. certainly the clinical, but, but as well as emotional, financial, uh, and others, and that in fact, it may be good for everyone's bottom line. Yep. So that's, that's a very good start with that. Just want to uh, talk a little bit about formularies. Yep. Uh, and I know we'll, we'll might hit on formularies a little bit later on uh, in the day, but the whole nature of formularies is changing these days, in part because of uh, the price of uh, some uh, medications, biologics and pharmaceuticals, in part because of other market pressures and so forth. Um, what is it about formularies now that is affecting patient access? And we'll also get into affordability. Carolyn, you're nodding your head the most, so I'll start with you. Sure. But okay. I want to he hear from Bonnie on, on this as well as well as others. Yeah, I mean, two things we've really seen emerge in, in how health plans are thinking about formulary design. Mm -hmm. um, one is shifting more costs onto the consumer out of pocket uh, through largely through the creation of specialty tiers. So in the employer market, we have virtually uh, no specialty tiers. They're becoming more common, but the vast majority of plans have never had a specialty tier, never charge coinsurance. It's a flat dollar copay for your drugs. Um, in the Medicare market, as well as in the exchange market, we see uh, almost every health plan using a specialty tier, often using multiple specialty tiers, um, with coinsurance rates that average uh, between 30 and 40 percent for the cost of a drug. Okay, so just hold on. Multiple specialty tiers, so you're saying like, like tier 3, 4, tier of what tier numbers are we at now? We're at a, we're up to uh, seven. <clears throat> tier seven now. We've seen we've seen I think nine. I'm but behind seven the times. Is, seven is the most common that sort of appears on occasion. I I was left off at tier five. I'm <laughs> behind a few of these. So that's going on. And what sorts of drugs appear in those tiers? Just you said specialty. Could you tell us a little bit more. Specialty, sure. So uh, you know mo most of the um, core cancer medications. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is, of course, self-administered drugs. We're talking about not physician-administered mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. chemo drugs, but are going to be on the specialty tier. So anything that is um, a biologic, anything that is going to be uh, injected, anything that's distributed through a specialty pharmacy, that all certainly goes on the specialty so tier. So given we're up to seven tiers now, this is a more highly uh, differentiated tier structure. Correct. What impact does that have on patient access and affordability? Well, I think uh, there, there's a couple of things. One, there's obviously a confusion factor, right? This is uh, a much higher degree of complexity of, of formulary. And again, that issue of an, of an information barrier, um, for instance, when you go on healthcare.gov, mm -hmm. uh, it, it shows you four tiers. And you can see the specialty tier cost sharing for, for tier four. Uh, and how a plan matches that up to their seven tiers is sort of a mystery. So you may not even oh. know what your cost sharing is, and you may not know where your drug falls on those seven no, tiers. No, like crosswalk to exactly. get from one set to the other. Exactly, wow. and unfortunately, uh, in Medicare, we do have a way where you can type in your drug and see exactly what the cost would be on a specific plan. We don't have that in the exchanges. Ah. Um, so there's an information barrier, but there's a real cost barrier. I mean, we have the combination of high deductibles and then coinsurance on the specialty tier, which both increases total out-of-pocket costs and uncertainty. Right, because most people do not actually know what the cost of their drug is going to be. You say you have a $60 copay. I know right. what $60 is. Right. You say I have to pay 30% of the cost of my ne the negotiated price of my drug. I have no idea what that is. Um, wow. And you know that becomes very hard to manage. It, it sounds like Bonnie. How do you manage that? There's a lot of there's opacity there, lack of transparency here when it comes to this. If you're yeah, sitting on I seven think. tiers worth and the patient doesn't know mm -hmm. how to go from there. I think from the practical standpoint um, and what we're hearing from patients um, is, you know, and, and what we've seen as far as the clinical enterprise is the burden on getting prior offs. There's prior offs, there's pre-certs, the time that it takes to pull somebody, as some, somebody out of a clinical setting in order to do that. We actually built, we actually did a, a, a cost study and a time and effort study with the nursing staff in our outpatient area and 80% of our business at Fox Chase is outpatient. And um, we were actually able to prove that we needed a full-time FTE 
to offload that, and we, we actually were able to get a clinical person to be able to work with the payers for those prior offs, for those prior instances, because some of those things would sort of fall off. They would you sort of start the process, or you'd be on hold for 20, 30 minutes, and you'd try to call them back, and the patient goes, that, you know, you have, a, you have a big GYN patient that, ne or that needs big time surgery and debulking and we want to give them Lovenox uh, for VTE prophylaxis and, you know, we started in the hospital and we send them home and they never got the drug. Oh. So <laughs> they come back for their post-op treatment and they didn't get it and sort of, again, that touch of navigation but also the responsibility of the institution to say, this is the quality of what we want to give is quality care and then what kind of resources do we need to put in to, to work with payers to get the drugs that the patients need to do. So, you know, it takes a little time and effort because, um, but we did it and it, we did it over a six to 10 month period and we were able to prove just in this FY15 um, budget that mm -hmm. we needed an FTE to help even support that in the operation. Does that area. FTE get to the point of dealing with individual patient needs and what their copayment status is and deductible status? That goes back to the financial counselor. So she works, hand, she works hand in hand oh. with our financial counselors. Right. Carolyn? I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll just interject. So we studied and 50% of oncology drugs uh, require some sort of utilization management prior author mm -hmm. step therapy in exchange plans. So you can really understand the burden that that places on, on a patient, but, but a lucky patient on the provider if, you, if they have uh, the necessary resources and to facilitate that. And the oral chemotherapy that. agents. I mean, we're, we're seeing more and more oral chemotherapy agents. You sort of manage it when it's within your infusion center and it's IV, IV treatment, but you're sending patients home. They need a whole lot of education regarding storage of the drug, taking of the drug, compliance there. And then, you know, and we're seeing more and more regimens and more and more oral chemos. And so that was, again, another looking at the trends, the treatment trends, and looking, you know, sort of staying ahead of the curve of what it's going to look like and what kind of resources do you need to provide for patients. So Terry, given your personal experience as well as your institutional experience, is the matter of formularies and how they're diversifying now um, be becoming a greater or lesser challenge? Is this good for patients, not good for patients, what? None of this is good for patients. Just none of none it is of it. good? None okay. of it. It's very confusing. It's very costly. When we talk about taking costs out of the system, how many people have you now 19 navigators and these finance people, they are new cost to the healthcare system. Uh -oh. There is an organization of cancer nurse navigators. Lily Shockney, who works with us, is the head of that organization. It now has 6,000 members. It didn't exist six years ago. New cost to the healthcare system. In the somebody's mind, they think that all of this control, ACAs and medical homes and whatever, they are layer upon layer upon layer of administration, causing this level of confusion so that we all have to create positions to unconfuse a patient who is dealing with a new cancer diagnosis. It's awful. So. In its awfulness, though, <laughs> do you not think that the navigation function is, at least in the short and intermediate term, advantageous until we get to someplace else where there's not this baseline confusion, or is that too optimistic? If you look up cancer navigation, you will find 40 different job descriptions in the literature. There are very few publications that document the outcome of navigation. When you do what you're doing at Fox Chase with nurses that are providing education to patients, there's got to be value in that, even though it's yeah. hard to measure. It's bringing anxiety level down. You can probably measure that. That's a good thing. It's costly, but it's a good thing. Navigation by insurance companies is something altogether different because it's perceived by patients as being cost control, not care. Aha. Uh -huh. And so you can't lump navigation all together or care management or whatever you want to call it, coordination. We call it many different things. And we've all spent a lot of money hiring these people. You can't lump them all together because some of it is of value and some of it is not of value. Mm -hmm. 
So a couple of great points you made. Among them, navigators are seen as budget items themselves. So they go across the system. And another point that you- 19 nurses. Yeah. Now, maybe Bonnie would make the case that all 19 of them are worth it, but that may be hard to do to your, uh, to your budget committee and your chief financial officer. Obviously, they've made that point. All right. Mm -hmm. And then, um, gee, you know, it, in a way, this, it's, it's, it's kind of discouraging, actually, to think about, because it, it sounds like it's a solution, but then you've given some of the, the challenges to it. Um, you also pointed out something that didn't come up earlier, which was, who's navigator? Is it Fox Chase's navigator? Is it MSK's mm. navigator internally? Or is it the payer's navigator? And there may be some, some suspicion along those lines. Uh, speaking of this, and I didn't have to ask for questions at 1020 because they've started to arrive. <laughs> no surprise here at the NCCN uh, Patient Summit. Um, on this point, let me just kind of read off a question that has to do about the role of oncologists here. Uh, we just heard that patients and their families are confused with navigation. And now we're going to introduce untrained oncologists to attempt to tackle the conversation that's around. Uh, we'll hear it later about the NCSIN evidence blocks. But really, uh, do you think that um, the role of navigation, in particular, the ability of oncologists to help navigate, um, is, is viable? This person is asking about untrained oncologists, uh, also talking about can this really improve patient care? Are there the proper tools and training they're going to overwhelm a patient and might even overwhelm their doctor. So I, I think um, the untrained oncologist reference is probably around the financial issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. Okay. And it's a terrible use of oncologist's time. I don't want my oncologist focusing on the financial issues. I want my oncologist to save my life. And so I think we have to provide the information to patients that they need, and we have to recognize, and I think the oncologists have to recognize how important financial issues are to some patients and that they can be a barrier. Identifying the barrier and referring that patient to someone who can get them over that barrier is what's important. For the oncologist to be an expert in this is a terrible use of their time, I think. Okay. Um also, with regard to, from the navigation angle, is the, the matter of uh, clinical trials. And so along the way through patient navigation or other input, when you think about access, we care about access to care, we care about access to clinical trials. What's being done to help participants hear about and access clinical trials? Is this a function of patient navigation? Is it opened up or is it limited by networks and so forth, Bonnie? So, I mean, because we have the model of a, of a nurse navigator, it's easy to sort of connect the clinical trials. So we have patients that call looking for specific clinical trials. So the other thing that we've done is we've taken, and there's all kinds of software out there for nurse navigation um, just to sort of track um, the workflow. And, and I can talk a little bit about sort of how we're paying for it because mm -hmm. that, that was really something that we had to work through and be able to prove. Um, but we decided to develop our own database and sort of link it internally with our scheduling system and all of those things. Um, so we have an internal um, IT system and it, it works really well. And so we were able to sort of move sort of our clinical trials menu to our nurse navigate and link with our nurse navigation internal software. So when a breast patient is calling uh, Fox Chase and our breast navigators talking to them, we could literally bring up all the clinical trials that are open currently at Fox Chase and begin to introduce the concept of clinical trial mm -hmm. and um, begin to, again, in, introduce um, sort of what does your first appointment look like and your provider is going to talk to you about the opportunities and, and sort of the clinical trials and begin to sort of, sort of I don't want to say pre-screen, but sort of lay that lay the groundwork, but at the same time be able to shoot an email off to a provider saying you're seeing this patient on Tuesday and I looked at her pathology and, there, and there's three trials that she might be eligible for. So beginning to, I've laid the groundwork, linking it to this clinical conversation and then just beginning to have that be more a part of, of our conversation. So that is yet another potentially potential upside to the navigation it, function, It is an correct? upside. And, it's, it's, and if, you, if you look at we have 16 navigators. I'd love to have 19, but I have 16 <laughs> right now. And um, so, I mean, looking at that cost, and so you figure the cost of a nurse plus her benefits, I mean, that's, a new, that's close to a $2 million investment um, for the institution. And I can't charge. I can't bill for her time or his time and effort. 
Um, and so we really looked at patient satisfaction. Uh, we looked at retention of patients. So, you know, um, a lot of patients come through our doors for second opinions. And so we looked at, we were able to sort of move that metric um, of the retention of patients and move that up. So we look at clinical trial accrual, we look at retention, we look at patient satisfaction, we look at time to first appointment and access to first appointment. And we were able to decrease that amount of time. Um, and then we also, we have that and then, you know, swing the pendulum over to the quality um, metrics and sort of those timing metrics and breaths. So from abnormal mammogram to diagnostic, diagnostic to biopsy, biopsy to definitive surgery. And so we were able to move that needle and sort of decrease that time just by being able to put that navigator in to coordinate that care. And so those are the messages that, that it's my role to continue to push to administration and, um, and, and also provider satisfaction. So there's been a lot of provider satisfaction with linking the navigators. And the navigators um, were, and I, I agree, it's sort of like nurses, like we used to do team nursing and then we did primary care nursing and then we go back to team nursing and then we're, so you know, we sort of healthcare, it sort of, sort of evolves and, and I've been in it long enough that I go, we used to do that. It looks a little bit different, but it, it's exactly what we did in 1976. Um, but the same thing in navigation. I think you have to continually evaluate your model, look at your model. Um, we're, looking at, we're looking at, does it all have to be nurses? Do you put non-clinical? Do you pair them up in a model? Um, I believe that they need to be disease specific. It, it brings that level of expertise up. So, so the needs of the disease specific team, the needs of the patients are met. So um, that seems to be the model that, that fits for us right now. But again, I, it's, it's an ongoing evaluation and proving mm -hmm. sort of the return on investment there. And you're gonna continue to have to prove, prove the return on investment. You did know, notice the aspect of our providers more satisfied with their work as well. There are a lot of ways in which these kinds of functions <coughs> and interventions can have benefits economic or otherwise. Right. When the providers call them my navigators, I think, I, ah. I feel like I've, we've, we've been a little successful. Then you've heard my good, good point. Lois, back to you on the matter of affordability, and this is reflected in a couple of questions, um, and that has to do with when you looked at the Urban Institute data that you helped develop and, and uh, the other work that you've done at Livestrong, on the matter of affordability and access, is, and uh, you've suggested this with a couple of your stats before, to what extent are concerns or threats to affordability truly having an effect on choices, access to care, and maybe even outcomes? Are people, to what extent are patients and families foregoing care or delaying care? Well, we definitely saw that with the urban data, the fact right. that people were, were really saying, well, <coughs> I'm just going, not going to <coughs> actually go to this appointment, um, I'm not going, I don't know to the extent, I don't know if the question is more around whether or not it's, it's more what drugs I'll purchase or choose to be on, you know, sort of the protocol decision making, or if it's just whether or not people will access care, like go see a specialist. Well, I'll put it, you know, as per NCCN guidelines, yeah. for example, <laughs> if NCCN guidelines are trying, the thing you're trying to achieve, yeah. does affordability rise up to a patient or, or, or family and say, and make them think, well, I can't get that care, or I can't get this medication, or I can't get this follow-up, and so forth. Is I, it affecting those aspects? I think it is. I think it is, and I think we probably need to maybe have a study, if that hasn't been done already, looking specifically at NCC and guidelines and how, how those decisions um, uh, sort of trend to, to those. Um, but the fact is people are, cost is affecting people's decision-making when it comes to care. Mm -hmm. And specifically, it's like I said, people with those comorbid conditions, people of a lower socioeconomic status, women actually, um, are we really seeing this more among women than men for whatever reason, um, when I, which I know you sort of highlighted before. Yeah. Um, and then also, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so just, I don't wanna lose the aspect there. Affordability is affecting yes. access. It is affecting choices. Yes. Let's not, the, the, the male-female thing that you just kind of reprised mm -hmm. there for a second, I don't want to kind of lose that. Yeah. How are, are women disadvantaged in some aspects for access, and if so, how? I don't want to lose that. We, we don't know why, but we do know, for example, in the Live Strong survey, that women, as well as adolescents and young adults, reported higher financial burden for whatever reason among the say 5,000 So it's a financial burden survey. issue as yes, well. Yes, yes, making financial sacrifices, going into debt, things like that. Yeah. We also saw something similar in the Urban Institute report. 
Now, granted, there are a higher percentage of women who responded right. to, to these surveys, but even when you control for all of these factors, you still see them emerge as... It's still present. Mm -hmm. Yes. On this, Caroline? Uh, not or on Or the women. previous point. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I think, you know, we, there's been a lot of research around, so for instance, how much cost affects access. Yes. Uh, if you look specifically at prescription drugs, we know that around $200 a month of out-of-pocket costs mm -hmm. tends to result in a major drop in adherence. Well, what's the threshold? Say it again. $200 a month. Results in a... Is, is when you start to see real adherence fall off. Okay. Um, just to sort of wrap your head around that, silver plans in the exchange typically have about a $2,700 deductible. Uh, so, you know, there's not, not only are we subjecting patients to costs that are higher than that $200 threshold, um, but we're also not, they're not balanced throughout the year. They're very front-loaded, right? And so for, uh, particularly for lower socioeconomic status, lower income folks, mm -hmm you know, being able to reach that deductible mm. uh, and then being able to reach their out-of-pocket maximum. The out-of-pocket max provides global protection, but if you can't pay the, out, pay the cost to get there, uh, that can be a real barrier. Right. Um, just before we lose the pen, back on the male-female issue, Bonnie, you are in charge of women's health there at Fox Chase. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any sort of differentiation there? It sounds as though there's at least a socioeconomic or financial component as Lois has raised female versus male access to cancer care. Is there anything about gender or sex that cause or have an impact or a risk for less access? Um, I, I think um, just sort of in, in, you know, adherence to screening and, um, you know, understanding, you know, that I think, you know, as far as what I'm seeing through navigation is um, whether it be a male patient or a female patient, um, we're seeing the same response yes. to when they do access um, Fox Chase, or they do access um, our institution for care. I mean, we, we don't see any difference with accepting navigation and, and necessarily um, compliance when we, when, when, you know, when we work with an, have them work with a navigator. Okay. I just, Lois's point, though, still rings that there's something going on there, and it's not, yeah. not entirely clear. Um, a question or two that deal with employers, mm -hmm. and because we talked about providers providing navigation services, insurance companies. What are you seeing with regard to the role of employers in, in supporting patient access, in supporting or, or providing other backup for, uh, for navigation services? Any of you on this? Yes, David? Um, we've actually gone out to talk to employers to uh, make them aware of the fact that Narrow Networks um, does not provide, uh, it does provide cheaper costs, but not the best outcome uh -huh. always. So we've shown them a lot of data regarding, you know, how we look, view survival rates for, um, for different types of hospitals and um, help them inform them about um, who's getting, uh, getting treatment, which is generally they're more senior people are, get cancer because mm -hmm. cancer is generally a disease of the aging. So uh, we find that it's been very effective to go out and talk to the employers and say, you know, it's very important for you to know that limited access plans might be detrimental to having your employees um, get back to work or mm -hmm. uh, come, you know, or survive their cancer. Mm -hmm. Terry, what do we know about the support of employers for this? And uh, is there sort of a level playing field or is there a lot of uh, a big gradient insofar as employers support of patients with cancer? Uh, it's really all over the board. Um, I will say that when I was diagnosed, um, beyond worrying about your own survival, the thing that hit me first was will I be able to work? And I'm fortunate I'm not a person who has to work, but working brings so much joy to my life that picturing myself unable to work was going to be the hardest thing about cancer treatment. And so um, right away my mind went to how can I schedule my treatments in a way that I will be able to maximize my ability to work. And when I went to speak to a surgeon and the surgeon said to me, you're going to be out eight weeks for this surgery, I looked at him and I said, you are wrong. I will not be out eight weeks for the surgery. And I was back to work in three and a half weeks. And so I think that working is an enormous issue for many reasons for patients. Um, for many patients, they have to work because that's how they put bread on the table for their family. For other patients, it's how they retain their health insurance. For other patients, it's their identity. They either love it or they are so embedded in it 
that separating from it increases the anxiety level so much that it's intolerable. Mm. And I think that um, employers are pretty clueless when it comes to supporting employees who are going to be in and out for a long period of time. They know what to do when someone's going out, but they don't know what to do with someone who is going to be in and out and who may present challenges in the workplace for a long period of time. And it's important to help them understand how to best maximize that because it's good for the patients. It's not good for any patient to sit home. That's psychologically bad and it's physically bad. They tend to gain weight and mm -hmm. these are risk factors. So it's yeah. not good for anyone to lose work. Carolyn, on that point? Well, I think that the other thing to think about in the employer market, I mean, we're talking about exchanges, a very small market. Yes. The reason they're important is because this is where all of the new insurance benefits are being created and tested. And then they start to spill over into the employer market. Employers are still saying, we're trying to bring down our healthcare costs. Insurer, what can you do for me? And they say, well, I have a narrow network product that's selling very well on the exchange. I have a product with a specialty tier that sells very well. Uh, in the exchange or in Medicare, um, and so there's, you know, there's a lot of mixing that happens between these markets. There's also policy changes, people may have heard of the Cadillac tax, it's been in the news a little lately, uh, that are going to further pressure employers to think about skinning down their benefits, uh, lowering the, the amount of money that they're spending on health care, and those are applying the pressure, the opposite pressure, uh, from what you're talking about, to actually move towards these narrower benefit designs, which then precipitate some of the challenges that Terry's describing. And are you, you're implying that narrow benefits designs are less likely to be able to provide these navigation services and, and employer support? Well, they're going to create all of the access challenges that we spent the first hour right. talking about. Right, right. Okay. Um, it sounds, though, you know, based on what you just said, Carolyn and Terry, that there is some headroom, for, there's some opportunity for improvement there. If employers across the country are not routinely doing this, providing uh, uh, support for their employees to get them back to work under the circumstances that, that, that are best for them and are individualized. There is a, a big gap there, but there are models for doing this better. Um, we have three questions on basically site of service here. Um, as one person pointed out, well, this has been a great overview from the perspective mostly of comprehensive cancer centers, but what about in the community cancer setting? Uh, also, another person asks, well, affordability has been referenced, however, site of care has not been discussed sufficiently. Are patients being navigated to outpatient sites that, and are they able to get equal quality of care and, and outcomes? Should hospital systems be reserved for special care? In other words, when we talk about, navi when we talk about uh, networking and we talk about uh, navigation and trying to kind of steer people to cost-effective care, is site of care cropping up here and is that a good thing or not a good thing? Lois, you want to come in on that? I don't necessarily have oh, a okay. <laughs> you look, you raised your eyebrow like, well, I yeah, think I know, I'm like, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Carolyn on that? Site, I, of, I, site of service? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there, certainly lots of folks are thinking about site of care optimization. Where right. can we treat people most affordably and most efficiently? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the question is for uh, the ACOs and the integrated delivery systems that you talked about earlier, yeah. they are thinking about this and have the power to say, if we have relationships or ownership arrangements with our physicians, uh, with outpatient facilities, we can start to think about what is the best site of care for the patient to uh, receive services and, and really direct. And so providers are doing a lot on that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the insurance companies are really doing it through a relatively blunt mechanism, which is the network design, right. uh, which isn't going to be as thoughtful of a uh, sort of site of care directed activity. Right. One might be concerned that all this sort of direction to reduce costs may be suboptimal for the kind of care delivered and kind of ongoing access and so forth with site of care. Uh, a question rose with regard to the formularies and costs, and this has to do with oral oncolytics, okay? And so how do you triage or navigate a patient who gets an oral oncolytic in terms of the price, the time frame, and funding sources. So obviously oral oncolytics are uh, an important, in some cases, breakthroughs, therapeutically and so forth, and uh, obviously the, the mechanism of, uh, of delivery is different and so forth, but is that presenting a bit of a problem, whether on the formulary side or the cost side? Questions, comments, Terry, on that? Um, here's where I, where I will give kudos to the 
pharmaceutical companies. When a patient has a problem paying for a drug, that's all, they will often provide a pharmacy assistance program for that patient so that the patient can have access to that drug. And we work with patients very closely to make sure that that oral oncolytic is going to be available um, to the patient. What you don't get when it comes from a specialty pharmacy or a community-based pharmacy is the pharm pharmacist expertise to educate the patient about what the um, side effects are, how to take the drug appropriately, how to store the drug appropriately. And so I think there's danger there. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have not, and we have many, many patients who are uninsured or underinsured, we have not had to say to a patient, you have no way to pay for this drug. We find a way to pay for the drugs. Now, when you talk about site of care, that is not something that a community hospital typically can do as easily or a private doctor's office can do as easily. And so there you have this tension about site of care. For poor people, it's often easier for them to access care in the higher cost location. So, sorry. Well, it, it is raised by those drugs. There are therapeutic breakthroughs in certain ways, but they raise other issues. Were there an insurer on this panel, she or he would not be happy about the pa patient assistance programs and so forth because payers do think in certain ways that they may undermine their ability to direct patients to more cost-effective drugs. Carolyn? We have a ways to go in terms of thinking about optimal cancer care regardless of sort of uh, neutral on oral oncolytics versus infused chemotherapy agents. And we still have sort of the archaic system of paying one way for infusion products and one way for outpatient drugs. And there's not a lot of incentive or uh, alignment of incentives for physicians to really think comprehensively about what's going to be best for the patient, best for the cost to the system in total. Mm -hmm. um, there's some new demos happening, sort of uh, bundled payments for certain types of cancer care that really seek to include both the outpatient drugs and the inpatient drugs or the physician administered drugs uh, you know, to make that to align those incentives and think about it uh, more cohesively, but that's really the exception at this point rather than the rule. So um, we need to make progress because uh, there's a lot of oral oncolytic innovation and uh, the incentives are really skewed at this point. So this addresses in part uh, two and a half questions on, on this uh, related issue. It has to do with um, at what point you, the, the patient gets advice with regard to financial capability. And what, what this question notes is that Financial counseling for patients often occurs after medical, though not after surgical treatment begins. How can financial analysis, and I would think support uh, information, be integrated into the treatment planning process so that the care plan is determined based on accurate knowledge of actual costs of being treated? So this is not just an information issue, it's a timing issue. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, how does that work out at Fox Chase? <laughs> I think, it, I mean, it's all about you know, quality of care and care coordination, and you know, you can uh, you can have a, a patient that come in came in and had a staging, you know, CT, and all of a sudden, you know, there's a realization we're going to take you off that regimen and we're going to try this, mm -hmm. and the decision could be literally made in that 20, 25 minute follow up visit, and then look and then look at the downstream of everything that has to be done in order to, and oh by the way, we want to start that patient on it Monday. You know, so you've got sort of three days to educate the patient, get the drug. You know, what if you know what if the copay is too high? Engage social work, engage the people, get you know get them signed up for the patient assistance program. You know, get the pharmaceutical company and get everything coordinated and get the drug in the patient's hand to start it effectively for their care, mm -hmm. right on Monday. And so I think that there's a lot of levels of care coordination. And um, you know, I think like I said, we have a long way to go, sort of. To figure that out, but, but if it in, impacts quality of care and it impacts, you know, um, survival rate and all of those kind of things, we, need, we have to address it. How do you know, because you and others on this panel but have talked about being sensitive to the moment and patients are different and have different sorts of needs, when's the right time to bring up affordability to patient? Patients come in, they're diagnosed, we've heard from a few of you about how distressed patients are, and gosh, you're just, you're just reeling from this. 
At some point, treatment decisions are being, or options are being put on the table and discussed. When does cost and affordability arise in this conversation? Because as one of our questions pointed out, sometimes it's way too late. How do you do that? I do think you have to raise it right away. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think Terry might, might argue that people need to hear different pieces of information at different times. And, and we certainly believe that. But we are hearing from constituents that, that at the very least, they want to know what their options are. And then they can make a decision accordingly. So mm -hmm. when we asked people in this latest survey that we're going to publish early next year, we, you know, we did ask whether or not they were aware of the financial issues um, that were causing them so much stress, if, if anyone had ever even talked to them about it. And I know there's an argument around whether or not oncologists need to be in this seat, and I agree with that. They don't necessarily need to be having the conversation, but being able to understand or identify, like Bonnie was saying, um, that there is a potential issue and refer people accordingly is really important because our constituents, at least, are saying they want to know um, because then we, when we asked them thereafter whether or not they would then forego treatment accordingly, a lot of them still said, no, we, we wouldn't forego treatment, but we just want to be aware of it. We don't want to be surprised at the end of the day. Uh. We wish someone would have told us. It's kind of like the same with fertility preservation. No one talks to people about fertility preservation, people who are in their reproductive years. They can still make a decision accordingly to your point of, you know, if, if it's about saving my life, maybe I will still make that decision, but it should be my decision. And I think that's the bottom line. We want to set people up to make the decisions for themselves at the right time and not just leave that up to the system or to the physician. But this sounds like such a, a delicate dance. You know, based on Terry's experience that she related, um, you need different information, at different, if you want it, but the, and if, if you, you want, want help, it, yeah. you need different information from people of varying skills and competencies at the right time in order to make an informed decision. Um, and when, with regard to the financial uh, question that th this questioner just, just posed, it's difficult to see sometimes exactly when you bring it up. We know not too late, mm -hmm. but how and when you do that is, is very well, difficult. Well, maybe there's sort of a menu option, right? So you're, you're, you're sitting there, you're hearing the words you have cancer, and, and a physician or whoever is in front of you can say, okay, do you want to know about your treatment options? Do you want to know about the price tag? Do you want to know about emotional support? And then you can have that com conversation. I wonder if it's a matter of inserting prompts as part of that. Um, experience. Terry? She's smiling. Terry's smiling. <laughs> what do you help us, Terry? Because um, it's fascinating because when you ask patients, do you want to know, they say yes. Right. But when you ask them, do you want the decision to be made based on cost, they say, they say no. Right. Mm -hmm. And that relationship between the oncologist and the patient is one of trust. And to complicate it with very complex um, costing of these regimens yeah. because it's not just the drug that you're, you have to price. You have to price the drug, the pre-drugs, the supplies, the post-drugs, the nursing time. And if you have to give new last day afterwards, you have to price that as well. And it's so complicated that we don't have the systems to be able to provide the information in real time. So it's overwhelming, it's difficult to manage, and can be overwhelming. Is that Believe me, on your first visit with the oncologist when your treatment plan is being decided, that is not where the patient's mind is going. Their mind is going to save my life, and I want the best treatment. And that's patients who cannot pay at all, and patients who can pay for everything out of pocket. So Terry, yes. you've kind of brought us to the edge of the cliff here. Mm -hmm. um, you just acknowledged how difficult this situation is, and you pointed out, as well as anyone I've heard, how truly complicated all these little financial pieces are. Very complicated. It's not just, hey, here's the price. So are you advocating a better way? No, because it's not only here's the price, but, oh, how far are you in your deductible right. or your co-insurance or for your co -bank? So it is individualized. It's, it's impossible. It's not complicated. It's impossible to tell any patient what their obligation is going to be. Okay, so I'm gonna have a closing question in a few minutes and maybe you can help us uh, move toward a solution there. Question from the floor, two questions from the floor, and if you could start with your name and affiliation and then your question, please. Ah, uh, yes, my name is Berlin, um, I'm a patient, and this is my approach. Um, in my line of work, I deal with various departments. I deal with Department of Defense, State, Agriculture, Interior, 
I mean, I deal with a wide range of people that have a wide range of needs, but guess what I do? I know what each one of them needs. So I think we all here know that cancer is a very individualized thing. It's very individualized. There's multifacets. Each patient is coming to you with something different, not just a different type of cancer. But actually, I can have breast cancer. You have breast cancer. But guess what? We can be totally different. Because when I got thrown into the world of the unknown with my diagnosis, I didn't have a very good, capable nurse navigator, and I would have stalked you like nothing. But I had to do all of my own research. I did actually want somebody to hold my hand. But I am also here to say that I think on just from being a patient side, I hear a lot of us pointing to the industry, healthcare, ACA, cost, da 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 da. I think the patient should also be their own advocate because I didn't stand back and just say, you guide me and I'll just blindly follow everybody wherever they are. I even read the Supreme Court opinion on myriad genetics. I did my own research. I bought the ACA from GPO. That's why I'm trying to read it so I can understand where we're going. So the and point, your, our lesson though, what's the lesson in that? The, the lesson is, is, is I have my card up there and I have chemo brain, darn it. So the lesson is, and I'm gonna date myself, I don't know if anybody remembers those books called Choose Your Own Adventure. Well, guess what? You're going to choose your own adventure, and you're going to choose it with cost, with the gentleman on the right. You're going to choose it on the left with how the individualized person wants to approach it. Do you want a hands-on approach? Do you want a hands-off approach? This is when we want to connect again. This is how I'm going to base it on the individualized person. So on Choose Your Own Adventure, you as the reader decided, do I get to turn to page 38, or am I going to turn to page 42? What's my adventure? Is mm -hmm. cost going to dictate my adventure? And guess what? With ACA, it is going to dictate your adventure. Yep. I'm just one of the lucky people that had catastrophic that started at 5,000. So that's why I'm just saying, for me, I mean, I, I hear, you know, I don't want any pointing fingers. I want us to all here be here. We're one team fighting one thing that is, throws curveballs on a daily basis. And so we just have to have an individualized approach and recognize that there is an individualized approach. I mean, look at the Precision Medicine Initiative. I have a check two gene mutation. We have to look at all the genes, how it's gonna impact everybody, not just age, because trust me, the first thing, and if you look at me, the first thing was like, oh, she's obese. That's why she has breast cancer. It's like, no, you have to break it down and figure out exactly what that individual has. They have a history of you know, like breast cancer mm -hmm. in the family or a history of a check two gene mutation. So I just think we need to approach it as a choose your own adventure to simplify it for all the sharp minds in here. So That's the way I would approach it. Thank you very much, well stated. <laughs> Bonnie, just very briefly, Bonnie, are you set up to help someone choose their own adventure with your 16 navigators? Um, I, well, I, and again, it's not just 16 people. It, in, in my institution, whether it be a community hospital or, I mean, you have various people um, on your team helping cancer patients, from um, the scheduler to the check-in person to the whatever. I think as, as long as you, you provide access to patients, um, and, it's, and what I've heard is I just want a, I just want a person's name. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I just, you know, I talked to Jesse when I first called. I'm going to call Jesse when I finish my radiation and I'm not sure what to do next. So people just want to have a name and they want to have a connection. Um, just like when you walk Start. into a place, you want somebody to go, hi, Bonnie, it's great to see you. You know, patients, patients want to feel as though if they have a question or if they have a concern that they can pick up the phone and, and someone will, will speak live on the phone and be able to answer the question. So there is, them. there is that individualized aspect. That takes a lot of skill on the part of, of navigators, uh, such as the ones you've <clears> mentioned. And you need to, now I realize you need to have somebody who, who can discuss Supreme Court decisions with yeah. highly informed patients. Mm -hmm. uh, name and affiliation here, yes. Yes, uh, I'm Beverly Cannon. I'm a patient advocate from New York State. I'm vice president of breast cancer options. I wear a lot of other hats as a, as a cancer advocate. Um, I want to first thank Bonnie, oh Terry, sorry, for, for very, very much for being on this panel, for participating and bringing us to the edge of the cliff, as you say, because it really points out if you haven't been there, you don't know. You have to have been a patient to really fully understand what it is for patients and to be able to begin to parse the individuality of patients. I also would like to say that 
<clears throat> there are many survivor-driven patient advocate organizations throughout the country, and we're being driven out by these uh, for-profit hospital takeovers mm -hmm. where they no longer respect our experience as patients and um, move us out of, uh, this is happening in, in my area, in the mid-Hudson Valley of New York State. We find it increasingly more difficult. This is an organization which has been in existence for 15 years. One of our, our first grants was a, what we call companion advocate program in which we learned we thought patients would be actually knocking down our doors to have a companion advocate accompany them to medical visits and, and learn very early on, as you point out, that not all patients want that because no matter how much experience we've had, we're still strangers. They'll tell us after the fact, oh, if we'd known you were there, oh, I would definitely have used you, but that isn't really true because they have to get to know you first. And, and that's very complicated. But the big thing is that we need to be respected for our experience and what we bring to um, this whole conversation. When you say we need to be respected, the individual patients or advocates or Advocate both? groups, advocate. advocate groups, groups that are made up not of professionals. I have no alphabet after my name, but I have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And, and I bring that experience and I want to be respected um, as, as an equal. Got it. Point well taken as well. Thank you. David, briefly, on the matter of informed decision making, I don't want to uh, finish the, the panel discussion without you mentioning a study that MSK did. And just if you could sort of get to the nub of it insofar as how certain types of information can help support the shared decision making, even in an individualized basis. David? Sure. Um, we looked at um, over 700,000 patients across the country who have cancer, who started their treatment. And we looked at from the start of treatment to the five-year outcome for survival for those patients. And what we found was that if you arrayed the type of provider that they got, that they received care at, um, as ones that are more specialty, uh, cancer providers versus community hospitals. The difference in, in survival rate was um, for the top tier cancer centers, you'd have a survival rate, and this is for Medicare patients, so it's a little bit older. Um, you had a survival rate of 53%. And if you looked at um, community hospitals, that same survival rate from 53% drops to 44% over five years. And um, in, we believe that that needs to be uh, we need to create a transparent process so that patients can see that this is what's happening. And um, legislators need to see that this is what's happening. We need to provide the access to, the, to, to these um, top tier facilities so that patients can get the best outcome for them. And I think that to, um, to Terry's point, um, you know, when the patient is coming in, to the, to, they want to know, I want, is this going to, is this going to make me live longer? Is this something that's going to affect my life? David, are we able to translate, are you or others able to translate the findings of studies like that into language and comparative presentations of options that patients can comprehend and act on? So um, it's, it's very complicated because, mm -hmm. um, well, for a number of reasons. But uh, to your point, yes, I believe you can uh -huh. create a, uh, let's say, a ranking list of this is what we believe as top tier institutions, secondary tier institutions, and it can be, you know, 10 tiers. It doesn't really make a difference mm -hmm. as to which tier they, the, um, you know, that we're not saying that the top hospital is better than the second hospital um, necessarily, because statistically they might be the same. But you're presenting survival data. Yes. That's hospital based. Correct. Okay. So we were looking at hospital groups. Okay. And, um, you know, our future research is going, is towards, um, for those same people, you know, w what is the cost of that care? You know, how do we, is it that we need to spend more to get the better survival? Or is it that the, that there is an upfront um, expenditure, let's say for nurse navigators? So what this does, and this is a good example of something that's happening more broadly, there needs to be an ongoing data collection effort 
that flows into findings that are readily comprehensible by patients and that can be transmitted by navigators and others at the right time to support the decision making. I agree, and I think that you know all these, um, you know, having patient representatives, having advocates, mm -hmm. those are the, um, if you will, the investment that you make to achieve that greater outcome. To which we all aspire. Last question from the floor. Name and affiliation, please. It's not actually a question. My oh. name's Diane, and I've been in the industry for 30 years, but I've also worked in clinical research, health outcomes, managed care, and reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And I see three gaps. These conversations are all great, but I don't see Lee Newcomer in the room. I don't see Michael Kologe. Mm -hmm. I don't see GM, and I don't see Walmart. And until we get all the stakeholders together in a forum and address the gaps of transparency, responsibility, and knowledge specific to cancer, access will continue to be an issue. And in my opinion, the NCCN has a wonderful opportunity right now to look at total health care costs in conjunction with patient advocacy, mm -hmm. in conjunction with great clinical knowledge, in conjunction with analysts, data analytics, to go to these payers and educate these payers and create a value proposition that everybody's not in a siloed argument, but everybody understands that cancer is different. It's mm -hmm. not hypercholesteremia, it's not hypertension, it's not diabetes, it's not rheumatology. It's a unique, specific, we should have a carve out. And once the knowledge is there and all the stakeholders sit at the table together and discuss this, then you'll have appropriate access to care. And the NCCN has a wonderful opportunity with their member institutions mm -hmm. to do this. Okay, well that's point well taken, and uh, and no, the stakeholder argument is, is essential here. Two, I think it's credit. I will say that NCCN has had all those people at at summits like this. Um, we wanted to focus right now on, on patient access issues, but and you may want to come to the NCCN annual meeting in whatever it is, March, and where I think some of those people may be present at panels maybe like this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I cannot get to two really good questions on molecular diagnostics. I'm sorry, but tackle us after the session. Closing question. Um, and as you know, at the NCCN Patient Advocacy Summits, we ask a closing question that is not pre-prepared, um, and uh, you only have a sentence or two to answer it, and you cannot say ditto to a previous person's comment. <laughs> okay, and so um, I want to, we're going to pick up on, on Terry's point earlier, and I referred to that kind of, she took us to the edge of the cliff there. And what we've heard about today is that uh, patient access in some instances, despite ACA, is still being undermined by certain factors market-wise and others. There are a lot of threats economically and so forth. Uh, but patients also feel the need for clinical information, as we said, economic information, emotional support, all the other kinds of types of navigation that you'd want in an ideal uh, uh, program. But here's the thing. Um, Terry painted it as, really, this is so complex, how can you ever really help patients really get there? It's complex for any patient, and then for any given patient, what is their particular status and so forth. So, David, starting with you, if we were to say toward a better navigated patient, toward a better supported patient, toward a better informed patient in the year, let's say five years from now, 2020, what would a truly better navigation or patient support system have as an attribute or two that would pull Terry and the rest of us away from the edge of the cliff? What would that one or two things be? Uh, David I, Rubin. I think that... Um, a very good question. Um, the, no time uh, to prepare. Um, what I think is that um, if you put information in the hands of the patient, um, the providers, insurance carriers, um, and basically all the stakeholders, that says that um, if we can 
hone in on what's important to that particular individual mm -hmm. who's getting that care, how can we, I think we can, by sharing that information, I think we can really hone what the decision making should be. Because right now, it's the Wild West, and there's no information about um, a great multitude of things like cost and, like, and survival and uh, adverse effects of, 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 of yeah. drugs that, um, you know, for that particular person. And I think that that might be uh, instrumental in making that um, change in 2020. So bringing that flow of diverse information and putting it at a point where a highly individualized decision can be made, support that. Yes. Thank you, David. Carolyn. So the bar is really low. So it's actually really easy, right? Yeah. So I'm going to go for the easy piece, okay. which I think is achievable, which right. is, um, you know, on sort of benefit design and cost, it's not impossible, right? The answer, we had, all of the data is there around what people's individual insurance looks like and uh, what their negotiated costs are going to be. Um, and, and we need better tools to help uh, navigators, caregivers, patients uh, be able to understand, you know, I have a care path. And this is what it's going to look like under my insurance, or this is what it would look like under multiple plans when I'm shopping. And that is very doable with the information that is, exists, right? We need to make the information uh, public, and we need to build really solid tools to help support those decisions. So, Carolyn, you're saying we, the information's there. Yep. We have to sort of pull it together, assemble it, and present it into tools that work. The cost information. The cost the information. quality information. You know, the outcomes information, that's much more complicated. Ah. The cost information exists, and we still don't have good tools. Gosh. So that would be step one for Okay, me. step one with the cost, you said. Very good. Lois? I think one of the questions um, highlighted care plans, and I would say, I mean, as a baseline, everyone should have a, a cancer treatment plan, a care plan, um, because that allows us to start with patient goals, right? And then you, along with your provider and your healthcare team, can really assess along the way what your needs are and make sure those needs are met, whether clinical, financial or otherwise. Um, you said two things, right? You're allowed for two. If they're both good, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they're both good. <laughs> yeah, the person was good. <laughs> but I, I do think with, uh, secondly, I would really point to this issue of equity. We haven't really talked about that a lot here. Mm. Um, but I would want all of this information that we're talking about to be available to all people in, in the same way at the same mm. time. Um, mm. Because everyone consumes information differently and different populations, different groups have different needs when it comes to health literacy. And so I'd want to be, be sure that we're not just sort of hitting a subset of the population, but, but really the population at large. Excellent. So starting with patient goals, an individualized care, individualized care plan, and equity of information. Points well taken. Thank you. Bonnie. Um, so I'll look a little bit, take a little bit of yours, but um, I absolutely think that um, pathways and um, really understanding what the roadmap and the journey is. Um, you know, interesting, we've, we've over the years held patients accountable for a, po a portion, and um, so I think we need some real clear role delineation as far as, you know, as a pa patients are the same 20 years ago, 20 years from now. I'm, I mean, they're, they, they want to live, they want to do well, um, and so I think some role delineations, like patients and their families are responsible for X. The healthcare system is, is responsible for X. The um, employer is responsible for X. The insurer is responsible for X because I think that's a very muddied water. And I think even in process and process improvement in our in institution, role delineation is one of the first things we do. So I think even in cancer care, and I think it will help that roadmap be a whole lot clearer. Um, because I think we stand, you know, as patients, and I did myself in my own institution, is who do I call next? Like, how do I get that done? Um, and so is it my responsibility? Is it the navigator's responsibility? Is it my doctor's responsibility? So I think clearly understanding, um, you know, who's, who's responsible for what yep. piece as we, as we move that along. That's a great point as well because these roles need to have evolved over time. Right. Patients are more informed. The payment system is changing. What the providers are able to do is changing. So those roles need to be delineated and perhaps re-delineated over time. Right. Who's doing what? Excellent point. Thank you. Uh, so Terry, can you help us out? We're trying to step away from the cliff that you described. So I think um, one of the things that would help would be for um, physicians to not be afraid to do a sort of distress thermometer that's financially related. Something as simple as 
are you worried about paying for your health care? Because we want you to focus on getting well. And if they would do something that simple, for those that self-identify as being very concerned, they can be referred. We have the resources in all of our organizations. Many advocacy organizations support patients financially. Um, there are lots of support um, ideas out there that we could implement, even in our providers. But we don't know who's in distress because we don't ask the question. So I think that's extremely important. I also think that the point was well made. It's the patient's responsibility. Patients are wonderfully diverse, and that means they're diverse in terms of their education and their capacity to handle what's going on in their lives right now. And believe me, cancer is not the worst thing going on in some of these patients' lives when they get diagnosed. And so we need to help the patients with appropriate tools to understand what they're going to be facing when they have a catastrophic illness like cancer. And I don't think the tools are necessarily out there to know where to find the resources. And I think it's very difficult to get the tools into the hands of the patients. Point that you laid out very well and not to be lost is that you iterated your initial point about why don't you ask first? Start with the ask there. And then you can kind of fill in the tools the information is appropriate. Well, listen, um, we're about to take a 15-minute break, after which we'll come back and talk about defining value of cancer care and value to whom. I want to first thank everyone who asked these swell questions. We got to about 50 or 60 percent in one form or another, and I hope we can have further discussion on some of the issues that you raised in other questions. But most important, you have got to join me in thanking this great panel of Terry Langbaum, Bonnie Miller, Lloyd's Place, Carolyn Pearson, and David. Thank you so very much. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you.